What I'd like to do with part four is wrap this thing up. I'm going to begin. I'm, I'm going to bring in a little bit here about uh, the biblical uh, statements concerning tithing. I'm not going to go into all of them because I want to talk first off uh, about abuses within leadership in the church and the problems that cause. Uh, then we'll get back to tithing, which is mentioned 21 times total under the word tithe. Tithing, th- tithes means one-tenth. That's what it means. Uh, specifically, what I mean by that is if, if Abraham had given 5%, it wouldn't be called tithes. If Abraham had given, been given, gave Melchizedek 15%, it wouldn't be called tithes. But he gave 10%, so it's called tithes. But anyway, it's mentioned 21 times in the Bible, 16 times in the Old Testament, five times in the New Testament. And, of course, I'm not going to read all those verses. I will share uh, probably three of them that I think are significant to know about. And then I'll give you uh, what our practice is uh, about ties with the uh, <clears throat> Bible Church at Pipe Creek and why we do it the way we do it. But first, I want to talk about abuses a little bit, if you don't mind. <clears throat> Uh, you got a lot of preachers out there in the world who are greedy. And uh, they're talked about, and they've been around ever since the first century, after the death of the apostles primarily. The apostles were a very particular uh, group of, of men that were selected as disciples of Christ and then called, with the exception of Paul, and Paul met Christ in the way, on his way to Damascus, uh, and, and uh, as a blinding light, and the Lord dealt with Paul over the next three years while he was in Arabia, in private, aligning himself with his calling, in private with God. But uh, <clears throat> the apostles, the writers of the New Testament, <clears throat> uh, I respect their writings as being inspired by God, as do I do the Old Testament. If you read carefully and in depth in the writings, they minister great convictions about responsibility toward God and how we are to live our lives. If anyone should exemplify that, it should be church leaders. And quite often, we find that they are excused of things that we would go to jail for. Yes, you heard me right. Uh, And it begins with the Catholic Church. And it goes all down through the Protestant movement, Reformation into the denominations. And there's always been good people of God, men and women, who stood out with an earnest heart toward the Lord and grew into a holy, separate relationship with the Lord in their maturity. <clears throat> that means perfection, by the way. Because the Bible talks about that quite a bit. It's a different subject. But a lot of these men... <clears throat> who are taking advantage of the children of God, they will answer to God. If they don't repent in this life and get down at an altar and ask God to forgive them and get back where they belong and get out of the pulpit, because uh, if they're thieves and robbers and uh, <clears throat> stealing from the house of God, from the treasury of the storehouse, stealing from God's children and making unreasonable demands of them that they don't keep themselves, then more than shame on them, they need to be trembling in fear because they're going to look at a judge who they can't lie to in the end. And I really, my heart goes out to some people who are caught in bitterness because they've been abused by these people and they fell victim in their infancy in the Lord, to abuse in such a way as to where it affected their security of their faith, the strength of their faith. So it's not just the money. It's not that these men are going to answer for stealing from God's people, from stealing from the house of the Lord, which I believe in godly institutions. But I believe in being run with the same attitude of charity as uh, we have towards the mission of the gospel and for one another. And we're not building 
crystal palaces and we're not building houses that are structured in such a way as to esteem ourselves and lord ourselves one over another. I myself live in very humble dwellings. I live on a very low uh, salary compared to the average income. And uh, I'm looking to simplify my life even more that I may serve Christ better in my latter years. I'm 62 years old. I, I know that the, the curtain of life is going to be drawing near and near. Could happen any time. We could be taken. And I don't need to add any uh, condemnation by abusing uh, the privileges of leadership uh, in, in the position in calling. The apostles didn't abuse it. Uh, the apostles lived of the gospels as the churches would support them and allow it in their travels. These men worked in the in the gospel. They traveled uh, many times under hardship, many times thrown into prison, and <clears throat> stayed in cities preaching the gospel for churches that were very, very reluctant to support their livelihood while they were there. Can you imagine uh, going to the trouble, going to another city to try to help a church establish itself and invest the time you have to have to prepare yourself for your calling and then, and then have to go out and find a part-time job to just eat while you're there? Well, that, the apostles had to do that sometimes. Does that make it right? No, what's right is these guys who are making millions banking millions and then getting out of the ministry the first time that they get caught uh, in some illicit affair or something and fly their jet down to South America or some other island or some other country and live in recluse, all the money they stole in the bank, uh, they're going to pay. These guys are not going to get away scot-free. Yes, they abused many people. And there are some of them out there, but there's also some good people called of God. And what you've got to do is get up from where you are and recognize what has happened, recognize the abuse of it. There's a lot of you out there. You have been abused. I know that. I come from a background of dysfunction in family for a few years, not of our own fault, but because the enemy got in. And messed it up for us. But we recovered. Because we were rooted. We had principles that we could stand on in faith for God. You need to apply the principles of the word to your life. To where that some other man's sin is not causing you to lose your soul. I understand the issues. But get beyond those issues. Here's how in closing. I need, I need to read these scriptures. My goodness, I'm going to have to carry this into another part. So I'll just go ahead and make a little more comment about abuse. My friend, you can point the finger and blame others all your life for where they caused you to fail. For where they caused you to be the way you are. Any of us could find places and situations to apply that in our lives. But that is not what the Bible what Jesus teaches us to do. We look to him for our strength. He's He's more than man. We look at people and we're going to find human failure. We look at people and we're not going to always find the perfection of God we're looking for. Don't set people up as gods. If you know people that are falling into that trap, at least warn them with the Bible. And I know some of you are trying to do that. But bring yourself out of the bitterness. Don't let it poison your soul. Get that bitterness out of your life. Get that debate, get that argument out, and get the love and the charity of God in your heart. And let the light of God shine in your life through his mercy and through his charity towards others. Well, I'll just try to wrap it up right quick. I was going to read some stuff about tithing. The tithing as a practice, as a principle, is all through the Old Testament. There's no denying it. Now, if someone just wants to just use it to say, I don't pay tithes, then just, you know, you do that. You don't pay tithes, just give an offering. Uh, but do, give an offering. I mean, after all, don't try to exclude God out of that part of your worship. 
Because we need to express our love to the Lord in every part of our life. And I want you to know, when people are efforting to do a ministry, we're rewarded by a spiritual flow. When it comes in and the Lord blesses us and he does things that are immeasurable in us. And you know what? I would be miserable if I didn't think that were true. I I made the choice to serve God because I truly believe in him. And I want to believe and think that most folks coming through that door are truly there for the purposes of God. I don't encourage people to come to our church for uh, our rented facility where we have church for um, curiosity-seeking purposes. I don't encourage them to just come over there just to window shop. I, I tell them, if you're hungry and thirsty for the things of God, and if you want to do right and you want us to help you, and you help us together for the cause of the gospel, then come. I would rather they didn't come if really they're not going to be serious. And that's really how I look at, in the in the end run, things about offerings. Uh, you know what? I have people tell me all the time, close to me, uh, I've looked at offerings and tithes quite a bit. And there's scriptures like this, Malachi 3.10, the Old Testament. Uh, I'll make the distinction because some people require them. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there be meat in mine house. Whose house? He's talking in the place of the Lord here. This is Malachi speaking in the place of the Lord. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts. Mine house, the Lord of hosts. Now you're his house now, but collectively the church is also his house. The church of the living God is the spiritual living body of Christ. And if we have a facility to where we can gather, I want you to know that's a good thing. But it doesn't have to be extravagant, and we don't have to make ourselves slaves just to buy new carpets and make it beautiful. Basic facility is good enough. It is. That's my opinion. You can have yours. You can say we don't need one at all. You can have us all out on street corners if you want to, in your opinion. Your opinion is not going to weigh with God right or wrong no more than mine is. What matters is what God's word says. Anyway, continue in Malachi 3.10. Saith the Lord God of hosts, If I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. That, you know, that's all the one I'm going to read about, guys. You already know about Abraham. You already know about the others. You can read them for yourself. You can look them up. Um, that's the Old Testament. There's five in the New Testament that re- reference ties. Uh, you can't truly say it's a, it's absolutely an Old Testament subject. Uh, you can't identify it as just being an Old Testament practice. And you could say it's it biblically just a practice for a particular people. But you know what? I'm, I'm part of the body of Christ. And whether I call my offering a tithe or not, I pay it. I give them. When I say payment's the wrong word, but I give them. My offerings, I, I mean, are more than a tenth if you want to measure it by the biblical example. But you know what? Does that make me anything special? No, I feel fortunate just to be a child of God. But you got to weigh your own heart before the Lord, and you are accountable before God. What God puts in your heart, you're accountable for. Not what man tells you you got to do. Not what man gets up there and tells you, oh, if you don't do this and you don't do that, or if you do that, uh, you know, I'm sick of that kind of business. That's not what we're about. We're about the Bible, and I'd like to go more, but I think we've covered it from my aspect. There's people who will cover it in more detail, and I could. I could take several more. Uh, sessions with this. But what I want to do right now is I want to ask you to pray for me, pray for you, pray for God's work, pray for the churches, that we'll just do what God wants us to do. And that we will quit biting on other people, that we will learn to be forgiving as we are instructed to forgive by the greatest forgiver of all, the one who was murdered on the cross, the greatest forgiver of all. God, bless us with a holy attitude. Bless us with maturity. 
that we can hold our offerings sacred. When my little grandchildren come to me and say, Papa, thank you. Papa, I love you. Man, that tears at my heart. It's so beautiful. God's that way with us. Let's don't be holding anything back from God. Our love, our emotions, our dedication, our time, our substance. Give God his share, whatever he's put in your heart. And I think you'll find if you obey God and what he puts in your heart, you're going to find out you you end up growing and God takes you to places. And you understand him. But if you, all you want to do is debate about it all the time and make up excuses for why you can't serve God because somebody else abused you or somebody else did wrong, I'm telling you they're going to stand before the judge that they can't lie to. And he's going to hold them accountable for the sins of their life that hadn't been repented of. In Jesus' name, I say farewell. God bless all of you. We can carry this on forever. But that's what church is for. See us at church on Sunday. God bless you. In Jesus' name. Farewell. Till next time.